Hey, I'm Sapphire. Wanna hear something scary? Our next chapter is from the No Sleep subreddit written by username Lana Lona. When I was nine years old, I had a favorite TV series. It had human actors and actors in animal suits and funny educational clips in between. I don't want to name it because it was a really good show and this story is not at all a fault of the show. I will just call it The M Show. The M Show was running for years and I had been watching it for as long as I can remember. I always sat down straight after school with my older sister Scarlett and my best friend Brandy who lived next door. It was our ritual. Every day, the three of us sat together and in the breaks of the show, we talked and gossiped about all those important issues in our lives. Then, I remember it was a warm summer Friday. Scarlett found a prize competition in one of her girl magazines. It asked questions about the show and first prize was a trip with your parents to Disney World. But even better, everybody who sent the correct answers would become a member of the M Show fan club. The same day, after watching The M Show, the three of us huddled together on the couch to answer the quiz. The questions were very hard. They asked details about old episodes of the show. Without Scarlett, Brandy and I would have never managed to answer all the questions. We sent our letters off and every day we would rush to the mailbox to see if our badges had arrived. Winter came and when the first snow began to fall, we stopped checking. Brandy was still passionate about the show and watched it every day but Scarlett gradually lost interest. When Scarlett stopped watching, I too began to skip the show. It was now early spring. I remember there were tulips in the garden and my mom reprimanded me for plucking a few to decorate the kitchen table. But right after her lecture, she handed me a small square letter with my name printed on it. The back said, welcome, welcome to the M show, show fan, fan club. club. There wasn't much in the envelope, only a short leaflet that welcomes me to the club and a small ID card with my name on it. Brandy and Scarlett both got their letters the same day. From then on, every Friday, each of us received a leaflet about the show with photos and anecdotes and background information on the characters. Occasionally, the leaflets also called on the club members to promote the show and to watch out for the M, M show, show tour. tour. Ever since we became members, we didn't miss a single episode. Then, in mid-June, we all got two leaflets. The first was the usual one with the facts and photos, but the second was an ad. The, the tour, tour buses, buses in town, town. This, this is, is your, your chance, chance to become an elite, elite member. member. The bus was coming next Sunday to our town. We were all allowed to go. We were beyond excited. The leaflet didn't have much information. This was before we had a computer at home. The tour bus would arrive at 1 p.m. and the main characters of the show would be there to welcome everybody and play games with us. Those that participated in at least four games would be upgraded to elite member status and receive a new golden membership card. Those nine days of waiting for the M Show tour were some of the longest in my life. Brandy, Scarlett, and I fantasized every day about how it would go. That Sunday, around 12.30, Brandy came running to our house. She knocked on the back door, like she always did, and I let her in. Brandy was beyond excited. Her mom had volunteered to accompany the three of us and she wanted to go early so that we wouldn't miss anything. At 12.45, Scarlett still hadn't shown up at my house. My mom said we should wait for her, but Brandy threw a tantrum. She was scared that she wouldn't be able to hug all the characters if we came late. So Brandy's mom decided to drive. I wanted to go with them, but my mother said that she would drive Scarlett and me. I felt like I was being punished for Scarlett being late. I begged, I cried, nothing helped. Brandy went alone. Scarlett's parents dropped her off at 1.40. I was mad at her, but my mom said if I made a scene, we wouldn't go at all. I relented. We arrived around 20 minutes later at the big parking lot where the bus was scheduled to stop. We saw the crowds from the distance, parked the car, and walked over. They all held the M Show tour flyers, but it looked as if the crowd were mostly parents. They stood in a half circle towards the edge of the parking lot. Some of them looked concerned, but most of them were laughing and talking. My mom spotted Brandy's mother at the other end of the half circle, so we walked over to her. Brandy's mother was one of the worried ones. She told us that the bus had been there, together with all the animal figures from the M Show. They had a large bus with the M Show logo, and they handed out sweets. 
One of the animal figures had explained to the parents that they had built a set outside of town where we all could make our own short film with the characters of the show. They said they would drive everybody there. They took the children first. They were all so excited that few parents objected. The next bus was supposed to arrive within a few minutes to bring everyone to the set. When I heard that, I was excited like never before. I ran to the street to look around so I could be the first on the bus. I didn't see the worried expression when Brandy's mother talked to mine. I didn't understand why the police came not even an hour later. In Monday's episode of The M Show, one of the characters came on stage and told us to call our parents to watch the show. Our mom was already sitting with Scarlett and me. The characters said that The M Show didn't have a fan club. That week, Brandy's parents cried a lot. I was still sure that Brandy was okay. I thought she just had so much fun that she didn't want to come back. She must have had a lot of fun because she never came back. Brandy's mother cried even more that Friday when the small parcel arrived. There was a new The M Show fan club membership card for Brandy. It was golden and said elite member in big bold letters. The parcel also contained a video. It was only a minute long, a minute of Brandy at the set of The M Show. She was wearing the same dress as when she came over to our house that Sunday morning. In the video, Brandy was smiling. An actor in a big animal suit stood next to her silently. Hi mom, I really like it here, said Brandy. I really wish you could be here. Then she laughed. I'm sorry the others were late. I'm sure they would have loved it too. The following is an abridged version of a story posted on the No Sleep subreddit by username Won't Think Straight. Thanks for agreeing to this, Sarah. Are you comfortable? Yes, I am. Okay, why don't we start with how you're feeling right now? Numb. Just like every other day. It never gets easier. I understand. What you've been through is tough. Why don't you take some deep breaths and let's start at the beginning, okay? Is that okay with you? Let's start with Tom. Uh huh. All right. Uh, what can I say about Tom? I really miss him, you know? God, I really do. It's the little things, you know? Like when I'd pull some clothes from the wardrobe and his cologne would still linger there. Luke was the only thing that kept me going. Luke's your son, right? Yeah, that's right. It was about a year after we had him that we found out that Tom had cancer. He hadn't been feeling well, but he had been putting off seeing a doctor. There was just so much to do in those early years, starting a new life together. The doctor said if only he saw them sooner, they may have detected the cancer earlier. Then it may not have spread. Then it may have been operable. Then he might still be alive. It was hard seeing him waste away. He was so sure that Luke was gonna be a sports star like his dad. He couldn't wait for Luke to be old enough for them to throw a ball around in the yard together. By the time Luke was old enough though, Tom was already too weak to even lift a ball, let alone go outside. He would just lie in bed all day too exhausted and weak to do anything. Instead of playing sports together, they played pen and paper games. Luke really loved playing hangman though. He loved guessing letters at silly words or phrases his father would come up with. And he really loved drawing that little hangman figure. He drew that a lot. He was terrible at the game, but it didn't matter. All that mattered was his dad loved playing with him too. I would sometimes find them both asleep in bed covered in paper. Tom would get tired easily and had this habit of dozing off. But rather than wake his dad, Luke would decide it was his nap time too. He'd crawl right next to Tom and fall asleep hugging him. That day came when Luke woke up, but Tom didn't. When I found them both, he was holding on to Tom, hugging him tightly. He was crying and pleading with his dad not to go. I love you, dad. Please don't go. We still haven't finished our game yet, he cried. And how did Luke handle everything afterward? He became very quiet and sullen, kept holding onto that paper pad and wouldn't let it go. I once asked him if he'd feel better if we played hangman like he used to with Tom. He just shook his head. To him, it didn't feel right for anyone else to finish it. But that changed, right? 
He reports that. Yes, it changed. About four months after Tom's death, Luke bounced back to normal. I just thought it was because children are more resilient, you know? I was cleaning his room one day and found his notepad. I flipped to the last page with that unfinished hangman game. Except he had completed it now. And it wasn't the last game anymore. There were dozens of pages filled with new games of hangman. When Luke got home from school, I asked him about it. He was a bit angry and a bit scared, but he eventually said he'd tell me if I promised not to get mad or punish him. So what was going on? His best friend at school had seen how sad Luke was about the death of his father, so he gave him a Ouija board. He told Luke it was for speaking with the dead, so now he could talk with his dad. Luke told me he had been using it and has been playing hangman with his dad ever since. How did you react to that? I didn't know what to think at first. I was skeptical, shocked, horrified, all at once. Part of my mind was flashing warning lights saying it's dangerous to be playing with spiritual forces we don't understand. Another part was saying it's complete horseshit. But all that noise was drowned out by the only question I really cared about. Did, Did it, it work? work? I was desperate. I wanted to talk to Tom again so badly I would have given anything for a chance. So after Luke had gone to sleep, I took out the Ouija board and set it on the dining table. I placed my finger on the glass ring and waited. I whispered, are you there, Tom? Please let me know if you're there. Nothing at first. Then the ring started to move. It moved to the hello in the corner. I gasped and let go of the ring. I must have just sat and stared at that thing for like an hour as if it was possessed. <laughs> well, I guess it was, kinda. I placed my finger on it again. I asked, is that you, Tom? The ring edged up to the yes in the corner. Where did I get the scar at the back of my head? The scar was hidden under my hair. No one except Tom even knew about the accident that created it. V-E-N-I-C-E. -E. My eyes were so wet with tears. The impossible was happening. It was Tom and we were talking. I told him I loved him and missed him so much. My finger was still on the ring as it started moving. N-O-T-M-U-C-H-T-I-M-E. What did he mean? Was he trying to say we didn't have enough time together before he died? Or that he doesn't have much time before he needs to go again? No, you left us too soon. Luke misses you too, I said. L-O-O-K-A-F-T-E-R-L-U-K-E. I am, and I will. It's been so hard without you here, you know? Or are you saying you've been looking after him? Because he says you've been playing hangman with him. I waited for a response, but the ring didn't move. I waited and waited, but it didn't respond to any more questions that night. Eventually, I went to bed. But you know what? For the first time for as long as I could remember, I was actually smiling. It may only have been a few words, but to me, it was everything. Did you try to contact Tom again? Of course I did. Every day I could. It was my obsession. I am A-L-W-A-Y-S-E-R-E. We talked about Luke and how he was doing in school. I we talked about our honeymoon. We talked about the dates we used to go on together. F-O-R-Y-O-U. We talked about anything and everything. It was sometimes surreal. Sometimes it was even passionate. There's some funny ones, you know. He once even spelled out, I watch you shower. Another time I told him that I didn't want to go to sleep because the bed seemed empty without him. I lie beside you when you sleep. It was almost enough to make me go to bed. Uh, can we talk about what happened that day you found Luke in his room? Oh, that. Yeah, I guess. That's what this is really all about, isn't it? That's why you're here? I figured we'd get to this part eventually. If it's not too hard to talk about. That's, yeah, it's fine. I've gone through it a thousand times before with the police. What's one more? Like I said, I'm numb now. It's still a blur, really. I had finished making dinner and called for Luke to come down. He usually yells back to me to tell me he's coming, but he didn't respond that day. I eventually tired of yelling and went to his room to get him. He was lying face down on the floor. 
His neck was twisted at an odd angle and his eyes were staring blankly at the wall. Near one hand was his pad and pen and the damned cursed Ouija board near his other. I just kept screaming his name over and over, hoping he could hear me. I just held him in my arms. My baby. My poor, precious baby. What had happened to him? I was hugging him tight and kissing him. I refused to let him go. Not after losing Tom. I couldn't lose Luke too. My eyes landed on the pad he was scribbling on. He had been playing hangman again. You were never alone. I am the hangman. I had a sickening realization that it may not have just been Tom that I had been communicating with. You were warned. At least not after that first night. A sharp chill began stabbing at my heart. The last game at the bottom. A completed drawing of the hangman figure scrawled beside it. It's the last thing I remember. Inside, I'm still screaming, you know? I don't think it will ever end. This holiday season, I was given an amazing gift, a Stranger Things themed Ouija board. And when I posted a photo of this gift online, many of you reminded me that I once claimed, I will never fuck with a Ouija board. Since that episode, my thoughts on these talking boards have changed. So in this final chapter, I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to explore this fascinating game that evokes such a wide range of emotions in people and attempt to answer the question, are Ouija boards inherently evil? To understand the Ouija board, we must first understand how it came to be. The general use of the board today is to come in contact with those beyond the grave. Spiritualism, or the belief that the dead can communicate with the living, was huge in America in the late 19th century. And it's no surprise, loved ones were dying left and right. The American Civil War had taken the lives of many young men. It was common for women to die during childbirth, and children died of diseases that had not yet been cured. Spiritualism gave grieving people a sense of closure. But some of the early spiritualist methods were too slow. Table turning, for example, required calling out each letter of the alphabet and waiting for a knock from beyond when the correct letter was said. Then, in 1886, a new trend was being spread among spiritualist camps in Northern Ohio. They were called talking boards and were essentially what modern Ouija boards are today. A board with letters, numbers, yes, no, and goodbye, as well as a planchette. A man by the name of Charles Kennard saw a huge business opportunity in patenting these boards and selling them to those who wanted a more efficient way of communicating with the dead. Many people believe that the word Ouija was a combination of the French and German words for yes, but it was actually a word that came up during seance. In 1890, Charles gathered a group of investors to help brainstorm ideas for what to call their product. One of these investors was Elijah Bond, who had brought along his sister-in-law, Helen Peters. Helen was an intelligent woman who also happened to be a strong medium. Why don't we ask the board what it wants to be called, she suggested. They placed their fingers on the planchette and it spelled out O-U-I-J-A. They then asked the board, what does that mean? Good luck. Charles went to apply for a patent, but in order to gain one, he had to prove that the board actually worked. So he brought along Elijah and Helen, who had never met the patent officer before. If the spirits can tell you my last name, then I will give you a patent, the officer said. So they placed their fingers on the planchette and spelled out his last name. The officer was stunned. Whether or not Elijah and Helen actually knew his name before the seance didn't matter. They were still awarded their patent in 1891. Although the patent never explained how it worked, just that it did. And the mysterious quality of the Ouija board only made them sell better. From then on, Ouija boards were a hit. One was used in an episode of Isle of Lucy, and one even appears in a Norman Rockwell painting. Ouija was truly an American tradition. So then how did this playful game become associated with evil? In 1973, the horror classic The Exorcist was released. In the film, a young girl becomes possessed by the devil after playing with a Ouija board. Captain Howdy, do you think my mom's pretty? It was then that the culture of Ouija had changed. 
Up until only 45 years ago, evil was not associated with the game at all. So now that you know the rather young history of the Ouija board, it doesn't seem so scary, does it? But hold on just a moment before you pull out a board and give it a try. According to Dale Katzmarek of the Ghost Research Society, the board itself is not dangerous, but the form of communication that you are attempting often is. The most dangerous mistake that users make is asking the spirits in the room for a sign of proof that they are there. By doing so, you are inviting them into the physical world. Who knows what may happen afterward? Of course, this is if you believe in the presence of spirits in the first place. To be afraid of a Ouija board, or any summoning device for that matter, it means that you acknowledge the existence of spirits and demons, that you believe it can open a portal to another dimension. But even if you don't believe in spirits, there is actually something pretty magical that happens when using a Ouija board. In a recent study from the University of British Columbia Visual Cognition Lab, subjects were asked a number of yes or no trivia questions. On average, their accuracy was 50%. Then, the subjects were given a Ouija board and told that they were moving the planchette along with someone in another room, which they weren't. Their accuracy increased to 65%. Dr. Sid Fells, one of the researchers, hypothesized that the boards were allowing the participants to access knowledge they weren't even consciously aware they had. It's like if somebody asked you the capital of Malta, and you're pretty sure you don't know. But if a Ouija board was placed in front of you, you might be able to dig deep into your unconscious mind and recall a time when you may have heard that information. So, do I think Ouija boards are evil? No, I don't. I think they are simply a tool that can be used in many ways. But would I ever play with one? I have heard plenty of stories about unfortunate events happening after playing with one, enough stories to make me stay away from them. On the other hand, I've also heard numerous accounts of absolutely nothing happening, which is what happened to me. Both times I've used one. I thought, maybe we weren't playing it correctly, or maybe we weren't in a place with much spirit activity. Either way, I'm not entirely sure that I want to keep trying, because then I might be forced to change my mind one day. What are your thoughts on the Ouija board? Is it really just an innocent board game, or is there something much more mysterious going on? Let me know in the comments. Like this video if it gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe to Snarled and our sister channels Hissy Fit and Slay Tricks. If you or anyone you know have any unique paranormal experiences, email me at somethingscary at snarled.com. Even if it doesn't fit in with a current theme, it might fit one in the future. And I do my best to read and respond to everybody, so please be patient with me. Until next time, sweet dreams.